The following is a Shaw Public Affairs presentation. Constituency Report is produced as a public service by members of the BC Legislature through the facilities of Shaw TV. Welcome to the show. Joining me in the studio today is the MLA for Port Moody Coquitlam, Ian Black. Ian, welcome. Thank you. We should start with the single biggest piece of news since you were last in the studio. Obviously, BC has a new premier in Christy Clark. Absolutely. Uh, what are your thoughts on her first few weeks? Well, I have to tell you, it, it's, it, there's nothing that reinvigorates a government or a political party like the arrival of a new leader. And I think, uh, I, I heard Brad Bennett, uh, the grandson of W.A.C. Bennett, I heard him introduce uh, Premier Clark a few weeks ago, and his, I think he characterized it fantastically as, as one with some family history in that line of work. He said that his grandfather was the right Premier at the right time for British Columbia, and then his father, uh, Premier Bill Bennett, was the right Premier for the right time. And then he gave accolades to Premier Campbell, and then said, and now, ladies and gentlemen, this is our right Premier for this time in British Columbia. And I, I don't think you could sum it up better than that. Uh, she has an energy and an optimism and a view that is, is being embraced by not just our party through that wonderfully spirited contest that we held to choose a new leader, but by the broader people of British Columbia. And it's, it's energized our party, uh, both in the, in the volunteer ranks and in the political ranks. And uh, we, don't, we could not feel any better about our, our fortunes going forward at this point. And frankly, the primary beneficiaries of those will be the people of British Columbia. Uh, we should also ask you about, uh, there's a change across the aisle as well. Uh, there's a new leader of the NDP in Adrian mm -hmm. Dix. Yep. Uh, will things be any different? Well, I think they'll be a little different. I mean, a Adrian's a, a very clever fellow, um, but he is much more the traditional NDP approach and NDP roots. Uh, he's got very, very strong labor ties. He was the chief of staff to Glenn Clark. So he has a lineage, if you will, in the NDP ranks that will take them, I think, very much further to the left from where they were. This is not an NDP, I think, that's going to appeal to the moderate base or the moderate voters in British Columbia. Uh, and, and so for, for our selfish reasons, I think it's great news uh, because I, I don't think he's going to have a message that's going to re resonate. Um, his messaging, no matter how it's dressed up, will be about taking British Columbia backwards. And we are very much looking forward to right now uh, in terms of the, the focus that we have. We're very proud of the last 10 years of, of what we've done with this province economically. And now with our new leader and a new focus, we have a chance to carry that legacy forward. And we plan to do just that, irrespective of who the leader is of the NDP. A new premier, a new leader of the opposition, and of course, a really big choice facing British Columbia mm -hmm. shortly. Uh, the HST referendum, what are your thoughts on that? Well, we're now at that stage in this, this conversation where it's, it's all up to the people. I mean, we have, we have announced uh, changes to the HST based on the largest consultation that has ever been done in the province. And, and without question, making up for the lack of consultation that was done when the HST was first brought in. I mean, there's, there's no one who's de debating that. Um, you know, where the, the motives were pure, the, uh, the, the, the objectives of what was being done and how it was being done was without question in the best interests of our province. But we surprised the electorate. And when you surprised the electric, electorate, rather, um, they react negatively, and understandably so. And so we've had a chance over the last number of years to, to tell the story on the HST, and then, under the leadership of Premier Clark, embrace a consultation with almost 300,000 British Columbians. An incredible interest from the public through telephone town halls um, and, and live meetings where British Columbians have brought forth suggestions, ideas, They've had a chance to express their views on what they like and what they don't like. And so we've modified the HST um, with lowering the rate from a combined 12%, if you will. Uh, currently, the PST is at 7, the, uh, the GST is at 5, so for a total of 12. And we've had the opportunity now to make changes to the HST that says if the referendum passes and people choose to keep the HST, that the rate will be lowered down to 10% and to assist families in some of the impacts of, of those items that are taxed to, uh, under the HST that were not previously, there's a series of, of, of rebates and, and, and whatnot that will go to every uh, child or the parents of every child uh, in British Columbia, $175 per child, as well as low-income seniors, also $175. And that's on top of 
the $230 or up to $230 uh, HST credit that's in place for low-income British Columbians today. So there is, a, for, for families that you think of the single mom with three kids, um, there is a lot at stake if the HST does not pass. I think that adds up to over $1,000. Uh, the, uh, when, you, when you work that backwards, that represents the incremental tax paid on all of your purchases through a year. That's an incredible amount of money. Um, so I think we've done the right things to position the HST now, to address some of the shortcomings that it was perceived to have, that the public gave us some feedback on. And now, with lowering the rate to 10%, British Columbians have a very simple choice in front of them. They can go back to a 12% PST GST combination, and incidentally there's no jurisdiction in the world that's adopted a PST system in the last 30 or 40 years, and it's because it's a very inefficient system, and it's not good for the economy. Or they can choose a 10% uh, HST. So it's 10% versus 12% with a whole lot of financial support under the HST at 10% to transition through uh, to the point where those the reductions take place. And I think that's going to be a very attractive choice for British Columbians. And I think they've had a chance to, to express their concerns. We've clearly shown that we've listened to those concerns. And I, I'm optimistic that British Columbians will make the right choice in this matter. But we'll live with that outcome either way. It seems to be the trend worldwide, doesn't it, with uh, more and more countries and jurisdictions mm -hmm. going towards uh, a value-added tax. Uh, have we sometimes not made the point that the GST and PST system is almost swimming against the tide? Well, in many ways, if there was a legitimate criticism in the entire uh, exercise, it would be that we took too long to turn our back on a PST-type system. And you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, I mean, there's now over 140 jurisdictions around the world who've got a value-added tax, which is what the HST is. So it's an, it's an identical model. And for all the noise and, and, and conjecture and a lot of rhetoric around the HST and criticizing it, people say, well, wait a minute. What about places like London, England, and, and, and Paris, and Rome, and places around the world where they've got extraordinarily strong, vibrant uh, tourist industries and service industries, and they've had a value-added tax system for an awfully long time, and in some cases, a punishingly high one. So we're not anywhere near those types of levels. We're going to have the lowest HST in Canada, uh, and, and uh, we think it's going to really serve us well competitively. But your point's bang on. I mean, we are, we're late to the party if you think about the HST relative to those jurisdictions with which we compete. Uh, I mean, we've got it really good in BC. We really do. And moving to an HST system, despite all of the challenges that have brought us to this point, and nobody's denying them, nobody's trying to make excuses for them, we accept that. But Turning to the HST is one of the ways we can actually protect, pr protect rather, this remarkable standard of living that we enjoy in British Columbia. Another topic of interest uh, in the Tri-Cities, of course, is the Evergreen Line. Yeah. Um, this is a long and complicated issue, but I, I would like to start with just a brief, what is going on with the project right now? Okay. That, you know, your, your question's bang on. That's probably the single greatest question I get asked when I'm, uh, when I'm in my riding. Um, whether at, when I'm at, at, at events uh, within the community. Uh, I was in a classroom the other day with some grade four and five students, and that was really, that was the second, I think, question that was asked uh, from one of the grade four or five students was, where's the Evergreen Line at? <laughs> when is it coming? Are we going to get it? And, and I think the Evergreen Line has fallen victim to a lot of the political noise as well. I mean, people have started um, second-guessing the facts. And the facts are actually fairly simple. The Evergreen Line has been progressing over the last uh, couple of years. There were up to 80 people working on this project. Um, we've now gone through what's called the RFQ, or Request for Qualification phase of that project, which is where um, the basic, um, uh, the basic uh, requirements of the project itself are put out to the 12 to 15 type firms in the world who might be capable of building something of this magnitude. I mean, remember, McLean, this is a $1.4 billion project. It's the largest capital investment into the Tri-Cities in history. And so this is a very, very large and complex project. It's 11 kilometers long. Uh, 1.4 or 1.5 of that is underneath solid rock. It has to be tunneled through. Uh, so this is very, very complex engineering, not to mention the, the other elements of engineering that go with these types of projects. So we've, we've, we finished the RFQ process which uh, it leaves us on the verge of being able to move to the next phase, which would be the request for proposal. And this is kind of the, the milestone at which we're sitting right now, because in order for us to move to that next stage, and this, this is my opinion, this is not the opinion of the, the, property, uh, uh, the project executives, um, but in order to move to that next stage, 
it seems to me we have to have the funding certainty addressed. And that funding certainty already has been taken care of federally and provincially. What remains at the moment is the municipal piece of that funding. And the challenge we have right now is that the, 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 the mayor's council, which is the group that will ultimately come up with the, their share of the money, um, has not done so to date. And there's a, a lot of history of this project. A lot of things have changed over the 25 years that it's been talked about. Uh, I mean, there, there are filing cabinets full of the various attempts that it has taken to bring the project to this point. But here's the most recent history that I think matters the most. And that is that we are sitting with a memorandum of understanding that was signed in, in the late fall of last year, within which the province committed to engaging in some conversations with the mayors about how to solve the evergreen funding model problem that they've got. It's, it's th their issue. And secondly, to speak in good faith about some of the options going forward for how municipalities can fund themselves. In exchange for which, they would make good on their long-standing commitment for the Evergreen Line. So that, that piece of it has not happened yet. As you say, it's a complicated issue with a lot of parties that have to come to some kind of arrangement. What can you, as the MLA for Port Moody Coquitlam, uh, do to help? Well, the mayors are in a bit of a difficult spot. I, I, I think it's not helpful for, for me or, or anyone in the provincial ranks to start kind of pointing fingers. Um, I mean, if you the, the brief synopsis of the history is that TransLink, which is the municipal government tran uh, transportation body, the mayors, if you will, basically came to the province and said, we need 400 and some odd million dollars from you. 410, I think, is the number. We delivered on that. I was very, very involved in that in my early days of being an MLA with the transportation minister of the day, Kevin Falcon, who's, of course, now our finance minister. The, they then came to us and said, okay, thank you for that. Um, we now need help getting the federal money. Well, in the 20-odd years that had transpired up to that point, a formal approach had never been made to the federal government. And so our challenge at that stage was to say, all right, we'll help you with that. So um, with the provincial government, the Treasury Board, uh, again, the Transportation Minister, I was very involved in that. And we worked with our, our MP, James Moore, and we actually made a formal business plan, a formal business case, and we took it to the Federal Treasury Board and said, this project is important to our community. Um, would you help us? And so they committed over $400 million as well. So both the province and the federal government have delivered what was asked of us to bring the project to the point where we are right now. And I believe it's about $80 million of the province's commitment has already been spent bringing the project along, keeping it on track, pardon the pun, to get us to where <laughs> we are right now. So all the gestures have been made in good faith. All the money's been put aside in good faith. And we find ourselves going full circle back to the mayors and the municipal level of government and saying, okay, you've got what you asked for, over to you. Like, let's remove this uncertainty. Let's go to the RF, uh, RFP stage so we can actually put a shovel in the ground uh, next year and start actually building this thing because all the work's been done. The engineering work has been done. We're down to what we call the, uh, the detailed design phase, which really kicks in a little further down. But all the basics, all put it this way, all that can be done in the absence of that final piece of the funding commitment, all that engineering work and design work that can be done has been done. So we're, we're, we're now at that stage where the, we're at this impasse. But to your point and to your question, the mayors are actually in a little bit of a difficult spot because, first of all, they're in an election year. And so the main vehicle that they have for providing funding for anything that the cities do is property tax. And property tax, for some mayors, is a four-letter word. Uh, it is something that they don't even want to talk about. And that makes it a little bit difficult because that has been the historical vehicle uh, for bringing forth ideas and projects and bringing it to life. In the case of the Evergreen Line, um, it's a number, I think it was about the $35 per household is what it would cost to build the Evergreen Line. And although I can sit here as a provincial politician or if I were a federal politician and say, look, it's 35 bucks, <laughs> just get on with it. Um, I don't live in their world. And so I want to be careful that I'm not sounding too judgmental of the mayors because that's not helpful. Um, but they, they, we do have this impasse where they're in an election year. No one likes to raise taxes in an election year. Those are the realities of trying to run for city council or for mayor. Um, and yet, there's this obligation hanging over their head to the tune of over $400 million. So that's where we find ourselves now. I think I've got a unique opportunity. I've got enough history on the file now to understand some of the mechanics behind it. Um, very, very much involved in the early days of, of being elected, which is over six years now, which is kind of frightening how quickly it goes. But I've got a chance to, to work with them 
on um, basically making good on the, the memorandum of understanding that was signed in the fall. It's true. They have not delivered what they promised within that memorandum of understanding. The memorandum of understanding was very clear about what we expected of the mayors. The province, in exchange, was to engage in some conversations in good faith about discussing different funding options that municipalities have got on the table today and what would they like to have tomorrow. We may or may not be able to reach agreement on what, on, on what the go forward plan is, but I can tell you that as the parliamentary secretary for public transportation, um, one of the things that I'm doing is working with the Minister of Transportation, Blair Lextrom, and trying to figure out how we can move forward with these guys in good faith and frankly fulfill our side of that memorandum of understanding which is to have the open and honest conversation and, and see where those conversations go. Unfortunately we have to take a quick break but please stay tuned and we'll be right back with Ian Black. Welcome back. Uh, when Ian, at the break we were talking about uh, the Evergreen Line uh, and while this isn't exactly a new story, one of the reasons it's been back in the headlines lately is the proposed gondola in Burnaby up to SFU. Yes. Yeah. Um, I, I want to ask uh, in your role as the Parliamentary Secretary for Public Transportation, mm -hmm. uh, if it has displaced the Evergreen Line as a priority, if it's, uh, if it's whether it's comparable, uh, I'm coming at it as a layman obviously sure. and hoping you can kind of fill me in. Well, first of all, I mean, I have to admit, I, I think the, uh, speaking as somebody who lives in that community, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, that my riding creeps up the side of Burnaby Mountain uh, on the east side. And um, the suggestion, I, I've, I've had conversations with, uh, with uh, Andrew Petter, who's the president, of course, at Simon Fraser University. And we've had some great conversations about this idea. And it's a fascinating idea. I mean, it's got to go through the community consultations, and it's got some of its own issues to sort out, just as a, as a concept. Um, I'm certainly not against it conceptually, but that's a far cry from the province stepping in and helping to fund this or, or, or supporting any notion that TransLink may have in terms of changing planning priorities. The province is very clear at this stage. Whether, whether it's a, a really creative idea like the gondola up the side of, of Burnaby Mountain up to Simon Fraser University, whether it's the SkyTrain extension out into Surrey, whether it's the UBC line uh, to, uh, uh, with SkyTrain or Rapid Transit uh, to go from the downtown core to UBC, we've been very clear, and Premier Clark has been very clear, the Evergreen Line is the number one priority and none of these other projects are going to be addressed or funding put aside for them or contemplated until the Evergreen Line puzzle is solved. So one of the reasons why I'm optimistic that we're going to break through and see some progress with the mayors in fulfilling that last piece of the puzzle, and it is, it is the last piece of the puzzle, is because of that fact, is that we're running out of other things to talk about here, folks. <laughs> Uh, you know, we can't really do a lot of long-term planning with large capital projects and some of these fabulous ideas on tr public transportation and how to improve the flow of people for our citizens uh, across the Lower Mainland. Uh, we can't really have m too many more of those conversations and anything other than a philosophical or conceptual level until we address, if you will, the elephant in the room, which is the, the, the municipal government, the mayor's council, fulfilling their long-standing commitment on how to fund their portion, the last portion of the Evergreen Line funding model. I want to ask you about an event you attended in April. Uh, it was yeah. the 80th anniversary of the charter of the Port Moody Legion. Oh, that was a great event. Yeah. Uh, well, that's my first question. Is first tell us about the event itself. Well, I have uh, I have a soft spot 
for uh, for the Legion and, and for veterans for a variety of reasons. Like almost every Canadian, I can point to different parts of my bloodline who served in, in, in the forces at some point in our family's history or, or not. And uh, so for, for, uh, for me, it's always had a, a bit of an emotional touchstone for, for those kind of family reasons. Um, but the Legion in Port Moody had a special place for me and, and because very quickly after I was elected, one of the first projects that I pursued was around the year of the veteran. 2005, as you may recall, was the year of the veteran. That was the year I was elected. And through a series of relationships I had, um, I was able to do a bit of a fundraiser to raise awareness, to commemorate, and to educate, and to celebrate, which is the kind of the tagline we used, um, the contribution of our veterans um, from the, those remaining from the First World War, who of course have dwindled down to nothing now, the Second World War, but also we've got the Korean War, we, we, we've got the, obviously the peacekeeper roles that we have around the world, most notably in Afghanistan still. And it was an opportunity to raise some awareness using something that is very close to me, which is music. And I, I was able to talk with the executive producer of an album that was created, a CD called Remember. And it was done for the Year of the Veteran, basically taking some classic wartime hits <laughs> and re-engineering them using up-and-coming Canadian artists in very modern interpretations of these classic wartime songs. You know, White Cliffs of Dover, all that kind of great stuff. And marvelous, it's just a terrific CD. I, mean, it's, it's, I, I still have it in my car, actually. Um, it's a great CD. And so we were able to repackage this for British Columbia. We got it into 1,100 schools. We sold it online. And we actually raised some money for the BC Yukon Command of the Royal Canadian Legion. And my anchor point for that effort was the Legion in Port Moody and uh, the Legion in, in Coquitlam as well. But the, the Legion in Port Moody is physically within my riding, so I always have a little bit more of a soft spot. Because <laughs> uh, that's also where I spend each and every Remembrance Day. Mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, do that very solemn responsibility of laying a wreath on behalf of the province. So my, my touch points into the Port, Port Moody Legion are many. Um, and so when they invited me to, to be a part of the celebration of the 80th anniversary of them receiving their charter as, as a legion, I, it was, I mean, I actually, I moved stuff around. I mean, that was something I just couldn't miss. And it was a wonderful celebration. Uh, there was a, there were parades taking place, and uh, you, you some of the photos up on screen right now uh, with members of the Legion, the Boy Scouts, the Girl Guides. I mean, it was really a full repetition of what happens on Remembrance Day uh, in that marvelous part of my community. And but it was an era of celebration, and it really was really well done. I want to ask you also about some. Uh, recent events. Uh, th there's a situation with Heritage Mountain and Moody Middle School. Yes. Uh, what is that situation? Well, it's, it's more of an update, really. I mean, um, members of my community know that, that we, we had cause to celebrate. Mm -hmm. uh, in the spring of 09, we, uh, to use a colloquial term, is uh, we pulled a rabbit out of the hat. We were able to gain funding to solve a problem that was growing in, in our community, which is that we needed a new middle school in northern Port Moody. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, there, was an, there was an also an issue with uh, Moody Middle School down in, in the center of Port Moody itself, uh, which was a, a dilapidated school that really was a tired and, uh, school that either needed radical uh, renovations or out-and-out -out replacement. And we were able to use the funding available from the provincial government under the seismic program and do the math and realize it was actually cheaper to knock down Moody School, build two new ones, including the one up in northern Port Moody, which is going to be the Heritage Mountain Middle School, um, instead of just renovating um, Moody Middle. And so we really were, it was a tremendous effort on this group of parents in my community, and they got me committed to it. And it was a great story of local citizens engaging their elected officials, getting them to buy into their vision of what they were trying to do, and then put the full weight of my job behind that and all of the contacts and the influence that I've got, and, and we managed to pull a rabbit out of the hat. So we've worked through a lot of the, uh, the school district rather, has worked through uh, a lot of the issues about the land for the school up on the top of the mountain, Moody Middle, or pardon me, uh, Heritage Mountain. Mm -hmm. um, there was a concern. Uh, the, the school itself was to be in Anmore, and then it looked like because the school boundary where it is right now is quite literally on the boundary between the beautiful village of Anmore and Port Moody. And uh, there was actually conversation about where do we put it. And it was in Anmore, and then it was back, you know, 300 meters away back in Port Moody. 
now it's back in, in its original location to do with soil uh, instability and, and uh, other engineering concerns. So uh, by way of update, we seem to have worked through all of those. It caused some delay because it was some very, very tricky land that they weren't able to really predict or anticipate. The placement of some natural gas pipelines is one example. And it seems that they've worked through all of those. So I'm a little bit of an observer at that now um, because it is handled now by the school district and the very, very capable engineers that they've got. But I'm confident that, uh, that we've worked through all those issues, and I look forward to the shovel going in the ground on those two projects uh, within the next year as well. We only have about two minutes left, but I want to ask you about another very significant uh, opening in February, I believe, mm -hmm. of the Earl Haig Retirement Residence. Oh, I know you were there for the complex. grand opening. This is a fantastic complex. Th this is a great model of where our government worked with through BC Housing and through uh, the Legion and through, uh, basically, there's a picture of it on the site there. This is a spectacular uh, building on... Uh, on the Como Lake Road, and I believe it's Como Lake and Linton, if I remember correctly, is the location of it. And it is just a spectacular uh, a facility. It was a, a bank of older post-Second World War, tiny little homes that looked like a tiny strip mall, almost like a, 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 an old motel. And they were able to use that land, build a spectacular facility, partner up with the Legion, with the land, with the city, uh, and the federal government, and the provincial government. And it is a, an amazing complex. And it was exciting to be part of the opening of it. The, 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 the units themselves are absolutely beautiful. And I couldn't think of a better place where people would want to spend the le their, their, their golden years, as it were, <laughs> uh, with great dignity in a great facility. And it's just, it, it exudes optimism in life. It's a wonderful facility. Have you got your spot pre-reserved? Yeah, I was going to say, I should really get my name on a waiting list. I think it'll take 50-odd years to get in. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Ian, we're, we're pretty much out of time. Are any final thoughts before we go? You know, I, I think, especially when I hit the six-year anniversary, as you, you touched on at the beginning of the show, uh, it has been and continues to be a marvelous honor to serve the people of my community. And I, I thank them for all the feedback I, I get by phone calls, by emails, telling us what we're doing right, telling us what we can do better. That's the nature of what makes this work, and it's the nature of what makes this job so rewarding for me. So I'd like to thank them for continuing to do that as well. And that is a great note to end on. Thank you so much for joining us in the studio today. It's my pleasure. Uh, if you have any questions about uh, anything we spoke about today or anything at all that Ian Black does, please visit his website at ianblackmla.bc.ca. I'm McLean Kay. Thanks very much for watching.